We're, which I'm calling further time management, but remembering how we're talking about this, you can think about this as just further guilt management or preemptive work. So there are five, five planks in my platform, uh, five things that I think um, are really useful. Only the second one is something that I actively proselytize about in the sense of sometimes like accosting people on the bus <laughs> telling them I don't think I really do that anymore but <laughs> anymore. Uh, anymore the first one though is the project week um, or planning ahead and so the view here is that um, some of us might be the kinds of people who um, feel ourselves chained to our bed in the morning with iron chains of worry that take the form of thinking about all the things that we have to do and working out the different ways we might do those things today. And then all of a sudden an hour has gone past and we are no longer allowed to go for a jog because we have to. And so instantly all the things we were planning to do are ruined, ruined. And so this is the thing, if you have this, um, and whatever version of, you know, you might have different versions, but of trying to plan at the same time as you're trying to do. So this first plank, the planning ahead plank, says, Let's try to separate out the plan from the activity. And so um, you can think about this, or like I think of this as uh, a kind of usable um, contingent binary in our being, which is that I think we can think that there's some part of us that is the creative doer, the writer, the energy, the kind of um, the mover. And there's another part of us that in writing is the editor um, or is the, the part of us that lays out what we're going to try to do. And so when we're trying to do both of those things at once, plan and do, the, um, the planner worries and thinks up problems that might happen and thinks of other possible, Oliver was talking about other planks that we could take, and that tends to actually derail the doing. Um, or stop it from happening. So if we have done some planning ahead of time, one of the things that arises from that is that when we're starting the day and we feel like, I don't even know, I can't even what, mm -hmm. um, we can look back at the plan that some other part of us helpfully laid out yesterday or Sunday and be like, I don't trust anything. I guess I'll just try to do this plan since it's written down for me here that this is what I'm supposed to do. So just kind of in the same way that at a certain point, you just, you're like, I have a doctor's appointment, and you just go to the doctor's appointment, right? And it's a, it's a past self that laid that out for the future you. Um, and on some level, we want to create situations where the past you, who is probably more um, rational and actually has your best interests more at heart than the present you, who feels like the world is ending and you better do anything else than right, like the past you probably is smarter and knows better about what you should do. But in order to set up this past you, future you, you have, to, you have to reason in advance for the future you. And a way to do that is to have project weeks. Before you can do this, you have to have some time where you just check how long it takes you to do something. So I recommend doing some version of time tracking. So for a week, write down what you do every day. I have a very embarrassing form. If you want me to send it to you, I can. It breaks down the hours. It breaks down the things that I try to get done in a week, right? So, so many times of exercising, so many times of doing reproductive labor, so many times of, you know, checking in with my grad students. I have check boxes, and then, like, just hour by hour breakdowns where you say what you're doing. A version of the project week that can work also is what, um, in that book that I was mentioning, The Now Habit, the guy whose name I forget, calls the unschedule. So that you schedule in all the things that are nourishing, health-giving, that keep you alive, and you let all the work fall around those things. Um, you look puzzled or just shocked? No, sorry, I'm tired. Oh, tired. Okay. <laughs> uh, you're shocked or yeah. puzzled? Shocked. Both. Yes. Okay. Uh, if you're puzzled, I can explain. If you're shocked, you can just hang out. Puzzled. <laughs> okay, puzzled. So the unschedule is you um, have a week where you put in everything in that week that you're gonna do that, 
sustains and nourishes your flourishing. And then the rest of the week, and those are things that you actually do, right? So that might be like cooking lunch, um, having a conversation with someone that you care about. And around that are all the other things that happen. Your TA work, working on your thesis, reading, right? So in order to set up a good project week, you just take, you spend some time where you just write down what you do. And so you see how much time you're actually spending on stuff. And this allows you to, for the next week, know how, how long you spent on things, actually. How long it took you to write you know, two paragraphs. Did that actually take two days? Because if it took two days this week, it's probably going to take two days next week. And you might as well just budget for that, because if you say you're going to write 20 pages, all you're going to do at the end of that week is feel bad about yourself. But you shouldn't feel bad about yourself, because you couldn't do that. So first step in the project week is check what you do in a week. Write it down. Figure out how long it takes you to do stuff. Once you know that, some people call this the Sunday meeting. Um, you could think about this at any particular time. Um, but let's say that you're going to work in a unit of a week, since we live in this world, and weeks are what people work on. So let's say that the last day of your week, work week, how many people here, well actually let's just not, let's say that the last day of your work week is a Saturday, because we'll get to point five in a second. So the last thing that you do on Saturday could be setting up what you're going to do starting in the next work week, right? So this is going to have to be very specific and doable. So if you know that you're totally able to write 300 words in a day, the project planning week would say, Monday, write 300 words on. Mm -hmm. So does someone, is someone willing to give me an example of something that they're working on right now? OGS. OGS. So by now you've probably drafted your OGS, right? So if Friday's the end of your project week and Sunday is the beginning of your next week, you would say, Sunday, cut 78 words from OGS, right? That's a doable thing to do. Um, Monday, make sure OGS is submitted. <laughs> <laughs> and then Tuesday, right? Work on paper for Alexis's class. <laughs> Before 9 a.m. Oh yeah, send it to the rest of your, your editing group. Um, Right? So you have this kind of like, it's actually a thing that you can do. So notice that you're not in any project week ever going to write down, write chapter three. That's not a thing that you can do. All that you can do is write section one in a week. Right? So project weeks are doable, actually doable things. And they get you toward something. So the bigger version of this, which is not on this list, um, but which, if your supervisor is not doing this for you, you have to do it for yourself or you have to ask them to do it for you. Which is to say, let's say that you want to finish your thesis and you want to graduate by a particular time. Uh, you have to get the thesis in by a date. That date is known. It exists in the world. You can know it, right? If you want to defend by that date, you have to get your thesis to the external reviewer a month before that date, right? Then you have to get the draft of your thesis to your supervisor and committee a month before it goes to the reviewer, unless they renegotiate that. So you can actually now, we're not going to do this because this really, when I've done it with my students, it makes them very scared and it takes them like days to recover. <laughs> um, but you can now be like, if I want to defend in August, I need to have a full draft by May. And if I want to have a full draft by May, and I know that my committee takes two weeks to read my drafts, then this is when I need to do all of this, right? <laughs> it's like fear. Just for the holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> but the holy shitness, what it can do is then you can say, okay, I actually can plan out. I mean, I had this because I have this, I got a book contract, which is lovely, but then it's like got a deadline. And so I've had to do exactly this. Like, what do I need to do to finish this by that date? 
So then you've already got project weeks planned out. And it might mean that actually what happens is you scale back the project because there's a timeline that you're going to finish it on. So you can't do maybe all the things that you might do, right? But that's also bringing this plank down a couple of stories. So it's not so hard, the thing that you're doing. But do you build in like buffer weeks in terms of if you don't meet those doable deadlines? Did everyone hear that? Do you, <laughs> do you build in buffer weeks in case you don't meet the deadlines? So the idea here is that you're, you're planning in a realistic way. And what the realistic way means, and this is hard for us to learn. Like I know of one person who is actually able to consistently tell how long it's going to take him to do something. Most of us are not able to do this. So we could think about this as whatever you're estimating it's going to take you to do, double that time. Um, now the buffer is, you probably also know how long it takes for your supervisor and committee members to get back to you on things. So there's definitely buffer to build in around um, just like your committee suddenly peace outing for three weeks, right? This is, but you can build in your own buffer and actually have that be in a will do kind of way, right? So what I'm saying is you don't have to anymore have this sense that you're writing as a mysterious thing outside your control that you can't predict how long something is going to take. That's a, that's a recipe for feeling like everything is um, horrible. Do you see why? Yeah. So if you're going to build in buffer, just call that the deadline. And like, yeah, for reals, I think that we're so unrealistic and so mean to ourselves, actually. Like this is a this is that thing. Like I was, I started off being like, we should all really have this kind of love for ourselves, and we should really. But it is the case that in, normally we're legislating for the future us, in a way that like, if someone was treating our friend that way, we would be like, you are not nice to my friend, you know. <laughs> but we're just like not nice to the future us. We set ourselves up to feel really horrible, and so this the thing about Project Weeks is trying to be like. OK, let's not actually beat ourselves up for that being all we got done last week. Let's just be real that that's probably all we're going to get done next week, too. That's OK. All right. Is everyone ready for point two? Yeah. I was just going to say I, ha I sometimes uh, find that challenging because like deadlines can also um, motivate me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know in my mind, you know, this week, this is my goal, and I'm going to hit it. And then, yeah, sometimes things come up, and you can't hit it, and then I'm like, well, shit, now what do I do? Right. You know, and then you feel guilty. Yeah. So, like, I find that to be very hard about, right, what you're saying about planning. Yeah. And knowing how to. Right. And actually, this is, so I agree, deadlines are our friends. And actually, all of these points are really about limits free us. So this is a piece of knowing our own neurosis and using it well. So it definitely is the case that when we say, just get it done whenever, because of all these patterns, we don't, right? And we, have, we believe that we do our best work under pressure because of that, right? So what I'm recommending is that we build in ways so that our, whatever part of that ourselves that is that requires a hard deadline from outside, to do to finish something, that we um, we dial back the amount of stuff that is running into that deadline. We create more limits earlier. That's actually all this is really. But yes, deadlines are really useful for us. And we want to create a situation where we don't miss deadlines. Because a lot of the time, this is the part about legislating for the future us un unreasonably. A lot of the time, we put ourselves in situations where there's not a way that we could possibly meet that deadline. And then we start creating these loops and habits of believing that we're going to fail. And over, you know, thinking that we need to do more than we possibly can, and then failing to do that, feeling like we're bad people. So that's a loop that we want to try to not reinforce. 
Okay. So the 45 minute unit. So this is one of these things that I just like, like I take it on faith, um, I believe it. One of the ways that I believe it is Dorothy Duff Brown, who taught me a lot about writing. She said they've done a study, and the study shows, and I believe this so fervently that I've never gone to look up this study because I just want to be able to it. <laughs> so this is time, and this is something else. Maybe that's not time. That's productivity, and that's time. Okay, so the study shows that our attention, our concentration, um, all of the things that were like our felt sense of connectedness, when we start working, this is when we start working. So time zero, um, productivity, and interest, zero. But this just goes on basically off the board. We feel more concentrated, like we're getting more done the longer we work. Hours and hours that we can be like sitting at our desk reading, thinking for like nine hours and we feel like I'm really concentrating now. And according to the Dorothy Duff Brown study that she cites that I've never read, this is actually happening in our brain. But this is our actual productivity, our creativity, um, the things that we're actually learning something. And when we hit 45 minutes, this stops. Completely. So we feel more and more concentrated, like we're really doing things, but actually we're learning nothing. We're not writing anything useful. We're just kind of like, uh, it's like when you're paging through the 97th wedding photo of an ex. <laughs> you're not, and that's what we do when we create these super long things. So the answer is, we have to force ourselves to stop and take a break at the 45 minute mark. There are people in this world who are rebels, they go to 50 minutes. <laughs> there are other people who are, um, do Pomodoro units, they go to 20 minutes. I'm okay with the Pomodoro, I can work with the 50 minuteers, but the only thing that is like gospel is you have to stop. So the 45 minute unit is you stop, you take a break. And while you're not stopping, while you're not taking a break, during the unit, when you're in unit, you do not answer the phone, you do not send a text back, you do not read a text, you do not read your email, you do not go to Facebook, you do not go to Tumblr, you don't instant message anyone, you just do whatever work you're doing. During a unit, if your child, a partner, or lover, or housemate comes in, and they say, can I just, um, you say, I have 23 minutes left in my unit. And they say, they back away, and they say, I'll come back in 23 minutes. That's what happens when you're in a unit. I know people who have unit hats, which I don't have, but it's really short. And so your partners, lovers, housemates don't even have to ask, because if the unit hat is on, you're in a unit. <laughs> One of my housemates uh, was in the back room and there were two doors to the um, backyard and there was a dog. And it was easiest to go through his room with the dog to let the dog out to pee and it was very hard for him to feel justified and like able to close the door and so we made him a little sign that said, Chris really loves you but he's working right now and you need to take the dog out the laundry room. And as soon as that was the sign, you know, like, Chris really loves you. He felt like he could then close the door, right? So whatever you need to do to have this be, like, a loving but solid boundary, that's what you do. You don't pee. You don't make a snack or a cup of tea. If you really have to pee, you can pee in the unit, but you pause the unit clock, which brings me to the unit clock. The unit is not timed by a clock. So you don't look at the clock and be like, oh, it's 2.15, I'm gonna stop at three. You have something that you don't even have to think about. So it's a timer, it could be an app, it could be a widget. It's just something that it's counting down and you don't have to think about it. And then, when it goes off, you have to stop. You can finish the sentence that you're writing, but you have to stop 
and move away from the computer or the pad of paper or the book that you're reading. That's the event. Any questions? Yes. It's a really good app that I've been using called, I think it's called Pretty Dirty, if you're wrong, but you can set up chunks of time, like 45 uh -huh. minutes, and then it tells you when to stop, you can pause it in between, and then it also times your break. Your break. 3030 it's called? I think so. Yeah. So it's nice to have apps that you can set, this is how long I'm going to work, this is how long I'm going to break. Now, I am not legislating how long you break. You have to break for some amount of time. You have to move away from the workplace. It's recommended to go like look at something outside or to like put your bare feet on some grass for a little while, stretch a little bit, you know, hang on your chin-up bar, whatever. Um, but you can have any amount of break. You could have a break of five minutes. You could have a break of three hours. Okay. So in the unit, you're coming to the end of the year. The timer goes off, and you're thinking, OK, like I was on a roll, and I got these ideas. Do you write them down, like, but it has to be within the unit? I mean, where's, like, how does that work? Like, how does that get Good open? question. Okay, so the unit clock goes off, beep, 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 beep. And you're like, shit, I have the best thing ever to say. So you really quickly write down, start here. Write the best thing ever. This is what the best thing ever was, right? So the beauty of this is that um, when you're in a role, it feels good, right? Writing feels good. And then for some reason that is totally not clear and we don't need to have an explanation, but we just know it's true, as soon as you're not writing, you feel like writing feels bad, right? Writing is the worst thing. Why would anyone make me do that? So the unit, the beauty of the unit and the beauty of stopping in the middle is that you're like, I hate writing. I'm not going to write. I'm just going to open my file and look at what I said I was going to start with. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I was going to start with writing the best thing ever. Right? So you're creating, you're, like, you're shifting the whole pattern so that you begin to cultivate the sense that you're excited to write and you're sorry to have to stop. And this comes back to the arbitrary limit thing. As soon as you're forced to stop writing, you feel irritated that you can't be writing, you can't believe that you have to stop because the, bu the buzzer went off, and you feel kind of excited to start again in a little while. It doesn't make any sense, but it just is true. Um. During the unit, do you uh, just free write or do you edit or do you save the editing for another unit? Or you another can do day? anything that is work can be in the unit. So you can be doing a unit of reading. You can be doing a unit of free writing. You probably won't because you'll get really tired. So you could have 10 minutes of free writing in the unit and 35 minutes of writing writing. Um, you can be revising in the unit. So it doesn't, like, the work that happens is completely up to you and open. It's good to have a project plan that um, structures that a little bit so that you more or less stay on task, whatever the task is. And the other beauty of the unit is you can pretty much do anything for 45 minutes, right? Like, you, and there's something also where you can say to yourself, I know this is horrible, but we just have to do it for another 16 minutes. Can we do that? You know, and then all of the yous are like, okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> So that you want to have some sense of steadiness with like, so like my project plans usually involve just like do two units on, right? I don't actually, I, it doesn't work for me in my writing to have product outcomes. It works very well for me to have um, in process. Because then if I've done two units, I've succeeded. Is there a magic number of units to do each day? No. Um, I can say that, so when I was finishing my dissertation, I um, had sort of like two and a half chapters more or less drafted, and I moved to a cabin in rural, rural Alaska with no running water, and I thought I was going to work on my dissertation about nine hours a day. Um, and, and I was like, great, I'm going to have all this time. And then it turned out that, um, it's very hard to do units. It's a whole different kind of way of working. It's much more intense. And I was not able 
Like on some days I could do four or five units, but mostly like three units was as much as I could do in a day. And I finished my dissertation and defended by December, so I moved there in August. So I did the whole thing in three months. Just getting back to the tenure. Okay. Um, my friend Jessica was working, she was teaching at two different universities um, and had an end time for her work day of 7 p.m. after which she just watched TV. And so she was like, you know, full-time job. And she finished her dissertation in never doing more than three units in six months. So the thing that about the unit, and this is why I proselytize about it, is that it is just unbelievably efficient, effective kind of work. And I know that we don't want to be capitalists with our work. <laughs> um, but I am a believer in that piece of the moment where Marx was interested in the possibility of automation as a place of freedom. <laughs> that says that the work that we're doing when we're struggling, we're suffering with our writing, does not help anyone. And so it's okay with me for this to be kind of like, I just put in the time and then I get it done very fast. Because basically I feel like everyone in this room, I'm sure, has like so many beautiful, interesting things that they could be thinking about and writing about. And I would like all the agony to be freed up to do those things and to just be very efficient with the thesis. So, um, my basic feeling is it's not, and I've now seen a lot of people do this, I don't think it's reasonable to ever think that you're going to do more than three units a day in a steady way. Um, and I basically recommend if you can do one unit a day on your thesis, that will be excellent and you'll get it done very fast. If you do three units a day of writing, are you supposed to be doing other stuff for your dissertation? Like it just seems like that's not a lot. I, it does seem like it's not a lot. No, you are not supposed to do other things. I'm including like units of reading, units of writing. Because it is for like if I actually count, I can spend a whole day at school. Yeah. But if I'm actually looking how much work I did, it was like two and a half hours, and then this guilt comes in. Yeah. Like oh my god, oh, I only did two and a half hours. hours. Yeah. Other yeah. people are going and working a physical job, and I was like chatting, having lunch, checking this, doing yeah. that, and I did maybe two hours of work. Yes. Yeah. Guilt in instead of being like hey, I did two hours. That's right. So now. I mean, like, I sometimes, with some of my grad students, I have rules like, and you are not allowed to do more than two units a day. Yeah. Um, does it ever work? Have you heard of people doing units together? Yes. So I have a writing group with a bunch of faculty. Yeah. And it's great to do units together because then, so we just go to a cafe, we go to press in the mid-afternoon, and it's, like, usually pretty empty then. Someone sets a timer, people are like, okay, I'm starting a unit. And everyone's like, okay. And then everyone writes, and then the unit goes off, and, um, and then everyone has to stop. And like, laptops close, notebooks closed, and then you chat. And if anyone's texting, people are like, <laughs> <laughs> So you don't read each other's writing particularly, but yeah. Together is great. Yeah, that's what I did for my my thesis. I got together with Abby and Melinda, and we kind of there's like a self monitoring, yeah, but also an accountability. Like if I don't show up to that meeting that we planned at this place, I'm not I'm letting myself down, but I'm also saying mm -hmm. I didn't like I'm accountable. Like yeah. they'll call me out and be like, "Why weren't you here?" And I was like, "Well, I would rather just stay at home." And they're like, "No, was, you have to work on your thesis." So I'm like, "Yeah." yeah. But it's a lot, I found it to be really motivating. It's motivating to do units with people. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, so I, I, I tend to like plan a lot, um, mm -hmm. but I'm also like a caregiver for one of my parents. And so I find that like while that's a really consistent thing in my life, at some weeks are just more difficult. Yeah. And harder than others, and they disrupt. It can like that, those things that you don't think are going to come up, or like yep. might be more emotionally exhausted, sort of like disrupts the project. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like I find that it takes me forever to like rebound from like a, a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so how how because I love this and I really want to be able to use this. Yeah. Can, can, like, are there any ways to deal with that like disruption yeah. like in a really like constructive way? Yeah. So it's really like I mean I think the baseline is just like kindness, 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 right? So that's the sort of 
so self-forgiveness as a sort of baseline thing. That recognizing, unless you're a very particular person, being mean to yourself has not increased the, <laughs> your ability to do your thesis. You may have tried that as an option, and it might not have worked for you. Um, so then I think it's really um, productive if you're in a situation like that where you're a caregiver for your parents or for kids or, you know, um, or you really like the main support for someone who's having a really hard time to aim not for um, product but instead for process. And so this is a, this I think is a generalizable thing to have instead of saying I need to finish this thing, say I would like this week to do at least six units this week. Right? And if you do any more than that, you're just a like raging success. Right? So that's also flexible, right? So the units don't have to be, um, you don't have to say I'm gonna do a unit every day. Recognizing that like some days they might be having bad days and you actually can't do anything but be with them. And other days there's time where you can be like, I'm gonna, you know. And it's sort of like, like if you have a baby, you can't say to the baby, um, <laughs> I would really like to get four units done today. <laughs> but there might be ways that you can say to people around you, I would like to, you know, this week I'm trying to get six units done. When are the times where um, the baby's napping or people are doing pretty well or there's someone else who can be on deck, right, for that particular time? So that you sort of start to build in just the process in a way that's very kind of forgiving. Yeah, um, Two questions. Uh, the first, um, you, you mentioned like if you have this, I have this great idea. I'm allowed to start with this great idea, but it's still a really linear way of thinking of, mm -hmm. of writing. What happens if you have like, like the, I'm, you're setting certain things up? So like you know, like how do you remember all the different, the little things, especially if you're only doing one unit a day? Right. And then the second question is, does anybody here want to start a writing group? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the second question is, does anyone want to start a writing group? Does anyone want to do that? Okay, so let's actually send around a, a piece of paper, um, and if anyone wants to sign up, I don't have a good piece of paper. If anyone wants to sign up for a writing group, we'll send around an email. Um, I, the writing group that I help do has a, a Google group, so people can self-manage their settings, and we just write out, like, I'm going to be writing, we usually write Friday afternoons and Tuesday mornings, um, but sometimes people will write and say, I'm going to be there at this time. So. I think that that's a really great thing to do. Um, but the first question was, when you have a lot of good ideas and you want to not necessarily have such a linear, um, like, okay, start here and write like this, I am a big fan, and I'll say more about this, of thinking about the computer not as a tool for organization, but just as a tool for production. And so I'm a huge fan of having lots of things around you that can capture and track interesting stuff for you um, while you're in a unit or while you're outside of a unit. So there are various technical, you know, there are various programs that do this. So um, some people use Scrivener, which is an online collecting um, pro product. I haven't used it. It costs a little bit of money, $25, something like that. Um, and you can put everything in there, notes, um, PDFs, text. Evernote is another one that does stuff like that. Right, so that you're able to, I have a chalkboard at home. Um, my friend Pete discovered that uh, shower board, which you can get from Home Depot in like four by eight things, is just the same as whiteboard. So he just covered a wall um, with whiteboard. You can get chalkboard paint um, mm -hmm. that you can just paint on and then you can write on your walls. Um, you don't like that idea. No, I love it. I'm not sure it's that my, my landlord's been like, about <laughs> 12 bucks a can? You can paint over it. Yeah. Um, so to have lots of things, pieces of paper, notebooks, whatever is your modality that allow you to have that quality of like, I, I thought about something, I'm just going to catch it. Yeah. So you can do that also during a unit if you're like, oh, I'm working on this thing, but I just, that made me think about this thing, that you've gotten it. And the whole vision, and this also is like, 
you know, who knows. But what they say is that the prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that worry, you know, that holds things and worries about them. And that if you overload things, if you're like lots of things you're trying to remember to do or work with, that it actually causes you to be more stressed out and worried. So that you want to have mechanisms that allow you to dump um, those things. The unit is one of those mechanisms because it's saying, I'm not going to think about all these other things that I could think about for this period of time. So this is very relaxing for you. You can just do the thing that you're doing. So we want to cultivate as many of those kinds of technologies as we can. Yeah. Um, what if you track how much it takes you to do whatever, and then you time it, you see the lift day, even if you do three units a day, you're never going to finish on time. Because I think that we have this tendency to push, want to yeah. push ourselves, so like, I have to do more and more and more. So um, that's a really beautiful question, and let's just bracket it until we get to the part about deciding how long your thesis is going to be. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions about the technicalities? Are we allowed to use listen to music during a unit? Yes, you can listen to music during a unit. Um, I, I I'm someone who has a uh, I don't think so. I'm dyslexic, right? There's certain things that it takes me a lot longer that I have like a whole thing about. And this is just my belief though, right? So this is the way that I'm being gospelly, and it is whatever works for you. But I don't believe if you're taking longer to process something or to write something, that that means you should put yourself under more stress. And I really do believe that trying to do a four or five minute, four or five unit day is hard and stressful and only something that anyone can sustain. And I think that part of this this thing of trying to be kind and real is to be like, what is actually possible to do and live? You know? So so maybe I should say something about this question of like, if you've tracked out how long it takes you to actually do something and you realize you're not gonna finish your thesis, right, at that pace, I think the thesis needs to change. I think most people are doing way more on their thesis than they should do. Most MA theses that I have talked to people about, especially when they're just starting, they're PhD thesis quantity of stuff. So it can really be this quality of just narrowing down what is actually possible to do for this thing that you're doing that will allow you to also live your life. Yeah. Yeah. Is there like a rough sketch of like first year and how much reading it is per week? like throwing in uh, other research for your final and so forth. And if, like, three units like pretty much takes up all the reading for the week I find almost in yeah. my rough draft. What do you suggest? Just, How to do that? Yeah. Okay, so as a daughter of booksellers, this is um, this was a terrible thing that my supervisor said to me when I was in grad school that I still think about because now I'm much busier than I ever was when I was in grad school. And so this is something that I actually hate about academic speed up, right? Um, I think that there is a certain way that we also are not ever going to be able to read everything that we're going to be able to read. So when I was in grad school, in addition to walking uphill both ways, um, <laughs> every class assigned a, full, a whole book. And, you know, so 300 page book. And it would be like, um, you know, like read Karen Barad's book. <laughs> it's like um, this week. And then there would be two other books that you were supposed to read. And so my supervisor said, yeah, we all assign more reading than we know. We know people are going to be able to do all the reading. That's just true. Um, you have to learn how to gut the text. And I was like, gut the text? That's an awful thing to say. What are you? What are you, a monster? <laughs> and, and he said, yeah, you know, there's just too much. You can't keep track of it all. So you have to be really strategic about what you actually need to read. And I said, what do you do? Um, and this, I feel like, I feel a little dirty saying this. So what you do is you look at a reading and you look at the first paragraph and the section headings and the last paragraph. And you look at, like, in those, I mean, it's a way of reading non-linearly, but you look at them and you're like, okay, um, this is not relevant to anything I'm thinking about. 
I'm re or I'm really interested in this other thing, I'm going to read this carefully. So it is kind of like if you set out what you can actually do in a week, um, it might not be the best use of your week and your mind to read everything very carefully. And in fact, usually what happens, especially when you're overloaded and you're trying to read like 600 pages of hard stuff, is that at a certain point you're not actually reading them, you're just passing your eyes across the page, you know, and you have no idea what happened there. And in that case, the sort of less are you a monster vision of this is to say, let's actually read the things, let's read, really read things, what we can read, um, in a sort of more conscious way. So units. Um, but just can we have a little pause and everyone just look at this cool thing that's happening? Which is, there's like a million crows that come and they just like fill those trees over there and I don't understand it. <laughs> they come, like they come all the way from the... It's a murder. It's like more than a murder. <laughs> At dusk, they're just like... <laughs> it's never ending. What? It's never ending. Yeah, they just oh, keep coming. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> They're coming home from work. Okay, so this is perfect timing for this, which is the third part, is having a stop time for any given day. So this is about limits producing freedom. So a stop time for any given day means that you decide before the day ends when your day is going to end, when your work day is going to end. So when you're the crow coming home to roost. <laughs> and after the stop time on that day, without guilt, without recrimination, without horror, you are allowed to do anything you want. Like you can watch as much TV as you want to. You can iron clothing, if that's what you want to do. You can read your novel. You can hang out with your friends. You don't have to work because your work day is over. So the end time on your work day could be a lot of different times, right? So some people don't start working until 6 p.m. That's when they actually get their work done. And then the end time on their work day might be midnight. But there has to be some cushion, I think, between the end of your work day and the time that you go to bed. So if your bedtime is 3 a.m., it's reasonable to say that the end of your work day is midnight. And you just get to play video games until 3. So the idea is you predetermine at what time you're going to be forced to stop working. And this means that um, that's going to be hard, in the same way that stopping at the end of a unit is hard. Yeah? So, and from your sort of perspective as a professor, does that include looking at emails or responding to emails? That includes anything that is part of work. Yeah, so that includes responding to emails. So is this something that you would like sort of lay out with your students at the, at the beginning of the class, or for us maybe lay out with our TA instructor or something so that they're aware that if they email us after a certain time, we're just not? Yep, okay. yeah. So you know, you could say, um, I stop checking my work email at 6 p.m. Okay. And I don't check work email on the weekends. Okay. It's very shocking. Yeah. It's <laughs> Yeah, but and then you have to have a little bit of discipline um, to do it. Yeah. You can decide that. I, for myself, it's useful for me to do administrative stuff in units because it helps me not. Um, it helps me not constantly check email during the day. Um, so if you can say the time that I do email is four to five p.m. And if you're really amazing, like my friend Stacy all summer was waking up and the first thing she did was write and then she would go to yoga at noon and then come home and eat lunch and not check email for the first time in the day until 3 p.m. Like, I just, I'm amazed, amazed, not able to do that myself. But there's pretty, um, you know, good data, if you believe the data, that um, when we start our days with tasks like um, grading little things or answering email or doing the sort of administrative, uh, you know, little creepy things, that it derails a lot of your energy, your creative possibility, 
um, of your day. And so, yeah. So, I don't think it's, I think it's reasonable to do units of work, right, in a day that are not your writing and research work. Um, so you might have like, you might have six units of work in a day, possibly. Um, and three of those units might be TA work, figuring out email, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. And similarly, if it's taking more than that, like in your TA contract, you have an amount of time that you're supposed to spend on administration. And if it's taking more than that time, it's useful to know that, to be tracking that, so that you can go back to the professor and say, I'm not going to be able to put as many hours as you have me scheduled into the final marking because it's taking me this long to do email. What do you want me to do? You know? There is a hand. Yeah. What about literature? Do why don't you just start and you're looking for your references? And then for instance, 45 minutes you can easily spend on just like what would be like 200 papers that you think they are interesting because of the abstract and conclusion, right? Yep. But like in that way, you're just increasing work, working more, but you actually not doing work because you're not writing anything, right? You're even not reading papers, you're just looking at abstract and conclusion mm -hmm. and see how it fits. Yeah. So how do you manage it? Well, you have to have a decision about how much time you're going to do and what. So this is the project week, right? So you might decide, this week I'm going to do five units of that kind of open research, just like looking at the abstracts of recent papers that seem to be in my general area, right? And then, but that's all I'm going to do on that, right? And then I'm going to do, and this comes back to a lot of people's things that they're struggling with are around constantly reading and researching. So if you set out the plan, you're saying, so I'm going to do five units this week of preliminary research, and I'm going to do five units this week of preliminary writing. Or five units of research, five units of writing, five units of summarizing what I found in the research. And I'll say a little bit more about how to do that. But that's the project planning. The, the end day to the work day is just whatever else is happening, you have a time that you stop. So, and you don't let that kind of just dribble out into the rest of your life. Whatever you decide is your end time, you respect that. But the, the logic here is that, um, so my, my aunt was an Olympic swimmer and then a swim coach, and she said that one of the things that people really struggled with, and I think this is still true, is overtraining. So that at a certain point, you're actually, your muscles don't have time to rest and recover themselves, and so you don't get stronger or faster. It is my belief that this the structure of academia right now is causing us to overtrain and that we mistake busyness and exhaustion for accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things are also really trying to structure a way for us to have time where we're just playing, mm -hmm. actually, not even doing self-care and resting, but doing like undirected rejuvenative play. So that's the end time. It allows you to do that. So it sounds to me like you're working too much, is what that means. It's kind of like the pattern overall, but I take the time to play, but I just build it into chunks throughout the day. So I'll go to the park uh, for a couple hours in the afternoon, two, three hours, and then I'll come back and do a unit, let's say. Yeah. So it, it's not really like doing it until 7 p.m. and then taking that chunk off to play, but okay, I so the chunks throughout the day. Yeah, so this is one of these places where I'm like, I'm being very firm and doctrinaire, and you can just ignore me. It is my belief, though, that if you take four hours off in the middle of the day, but you have this feeling like, I have to do another five units today, 
that you don't actually enjoy the three hours that you're taking off. And that a lot of us have this time where we're like not actually done. We're just taking a break in a way that feels not quite actually relaxing. Um, so that's what this is trying to move us out of. But, I, but Christine, I believe that you could have a different you might be a superhero. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so that's the other time. Like this is I'm saying end time to the day. You can also have a start time of the day where you're not allowed to start until that time. And you just have to like lie in bed reading novels until then. Or taking the dog to the park. You know? Yeah. You can you can work with this. So structured procrastination, I've said a bunch of stuff about it, and I'll just say a few more things which is that, um, and this is part of using our neurosis, like using what we know about neurosis as a um, useful thing. So um, this means when we have a will-do list, a set of things that we're gonna do in a day, um, and there's something that we don't want to do. Structured procrastination means that we pick one of the things that we want to do slightly, um, that we, okay, so we have all these things that we basically don't wanna do because we don't remember that we actually like them. Then, there are some things that we don't want to do slightly less than other things, right? So we might not want to mark papers, and we might not want to work on our OGS, and we might not want to read something that we have to read. So structured procrastination is, which of those things do you not want to do with the least intensity, right? So you would rather do anything than mark papers. So maybe you can work on the OGS, because that's the next thing that you really don't want to do. But if you really don't want to work on the OGS either, probably you could read this thing. So structured procrastination can work like that, where you just do, you actually get a tremendous amount done, because you're always doing something that you just don't want to do slightly less than all the other things you don't want to do. The other way that structured procrastination can work is that you say to yourself, I know, we don't want to do that. So we won't do that, we'll just open the document. Obviously I'm not gonna work on the book, that would be impossible, that's a horrible idea. I'm not gonna work on the book, I'm just gonna open that file and read the first paragraph. So this is just exactly the same thing as, um, I don't, obviously I couldn't possibly go for a run, I'm just gonna put all my running clothes on and walk out the front door, <laughs> right? And then once you're there, you're like, oh I could walk down the block, okay, and then all of a sudden you're like, I like running, it's great. I'm so glad I went for a run. <laughs> so it's the same thing. So structured procrastination is actively saying, of course, no one could ask anyone to do that. But maybe we could just do this. I'm not going to work on this, I'm just going to do this. So that's structured procrastination. Make sense? Okay, last thing um, in this section, then we'll take another short break. So this is that um, it is necessary for you to take a day off. A day off. As an entitlement, not as a reward. So normally what happens is that we say, if I'm very, very good this week and I get a lot of things done, I can take a day off. And that's that you're getting a reward for good behavior. This is the opposite of that. You just get a day off, just in virtue of breathing. And the day off has to be something where it's whatever is the equivalent for you of lying on the couch, um, reading novels, and eating pie. <laughs> so that could be going on a really long hike. It could be a whole lot of other things. But it just has to be something that is not working at all. So it doesn't mean you take a day off from writing your thesis in order to do your TA ship. It's that you get a day off altogether. I give a version of this workshop to um, activists, and in that space, usually what works here is to say, um, when industrialization came into effect and electric lights happened, there was the possibility to stretch the working day immeasurably, right? And at that point, the struggle became, and the slogan was, eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for what we will. And people struggled and died to get us the eight hour work day. They struggled and they died so that we could have weekends, right? It mattered to them so much that we have time for unstructured play, that they were willing to lay down our lives. 
and we disrespect them if we allow ourselves to fall into a capitalist logic that says that we are only worth anything if we are working constantly and we are so tired and we get sick and that's when we're allowed to take a break. That line totally works with activists. I don't know if it actually worked for you. Um, so if it doesn't work for you, here's the other line that might work for you. Um, if you were trying to be a weightlifter, if you were trying to be someone who um, was efficient and you needed to get a lot of things done, which anyone who's doing a dissertation or a thesis does, you need to get a lot of things done. One of the things we know is that people who are constantly working at their very maximum are not working effectively. They're not working smart. They're not getting a lot of things actually done. They just feel busy. And what you need is to finish your thesis. You don't need to feel busy. So in order to finish your thesis more effectively, you have to rest. You have to take breaks. Otherwise, you're putting yourself in a situation where you're actually never going to finish because you're just going to be constantly working badly. So whichever of those work for you, take that and have a day off. So the second one is basically a, a, deepen, a deepening capitalist logic that says, in order to work well, the worker needs to rest. The first one is an anti-capitalist logic, but happily, both of them produce you having a day off. <laughs> Um, this doesn't mean that you can say to your partner and your kids, um, I'm taking a day off, <laughs> you make dinner and do the laundry. <laughs> okay, so like you still have to do the basic things, like you probably will brush your teeth and maybe take a shower and, you know, um, but that it's leisure and it's play. <laughs> Because I'm thinking, like, there are times where you get into the work and you truly are enjoying reading a part that's connected to the work, but you do it at a much more relaxed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that, is that... No. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even if your dissertation is giving you pleasure, you're not allowed to work on it on your day off. I, yeah, but see, look at what just happened. He's like, I want to work on my dissertation on, the way, on my day off. So actually, that's a good feeling to have about your dissertation, that you're like, damn it, I can't work, it's my day off, I can't wait for tomorrow. And that's a much better feeling to have than, um, I, I didn't get anything done today, I'm a bad person, maybe tomorrow I'll get something done, right? Like I couldn't come do that fun thing that you invited me to do because I had to work on my dissertation. I didn't even get anything done on my dissertation and I didn't do the fun thing. How many people feel like they're going to be able to take a day off? Hey, that's way better than usually. No, okay. You're probably the only honest person. Why don't you think you'll be able to take a day off? Because mine is due in like two weeks. <laughs> you can't take a day off, but you can take some days off after. But you can. You can have an end, day to, end time to your work day, and you can take breaks in between units, and you should. I'll try. You have to, because it is so. We're talking mostly. We're talking when people need to take a day off a week. It's the it's a long term, but actually it's the same. Like you're gonna go into adrenal overload if you try to only work all the time. So you're gonna be faster and better worker if you take day breaks and end times to days. I promise. You can write to me in two weeks and be like, you were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> But I believe it very strongly. Yeah. Um, I have a hard time taking breaks just from emails. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, like not responding to an email at all for a whole day. Mm -hmm. like, that. like that will be very difficult for me. Yeah. Like, yeah. From work emails or from like emails for? Yeah. yeah. Like school, TA. Um, do you have different email addresses that you use for? Yeah. You do? So you have like a place where all of your Carlton email goes that's separate from your personal email? Uh, well, it all eventually gets to my phone. Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I would undo that. Right. I'm serious. You're like, yeah. <laughs> or like you can actually undo that for a day, right? So let's say you want to still be able to get email from your mom. You can take the, you can just take the account off your phone.